how does winning the lottery compare to having a video that gets over 32 million views? Getting a video that large is like winning the lottery again. So I am so excited to welcome Sydney Bean to the program. She is a TikToker and also a lottery winner. Sydney, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to join today. What did you win and, and how did this happen? So in December of 2021, I went to visit my family in eastern Idaho. And every year on Christmas, we play a game. We kind of refer to it as the bucket game. It's an unofficial game that we put together where we take those five-gallon paint buckets from the hardware store. And then we take turns, my three siblings and my two moms and I, throwing a beanbag into the bucket. And when you get it into the bucket, then you receive a scratch ticket. So my mom had bought like $150 worth of scratch tickets, just the $1 and $5 ones this year. And when it was my turn, we had done a few rounds and I kept missing and my kind of my stack of cards was pretty small. So I asked my mom when I missed again if I could have a second try. And she said, OK, you can have another try. So I throw in the beanbag and I make it in the bucket that time. And then the ticket that I pick up, it was a $5 scratcher. It was a Sleigh Bells, like holiday themed scratch ticket. And that ended up winning me the grand prize on that ticket, which was $50,000. So that is how I became a lottery winner. Wow. Well, congratulations. That, that is extraordinary. And you had some national media attention and had a, a video go extremely viral with over 32 million views, and I want to get to that in a little bit, but when you won this prize on a scratch ticket, a single scratch ticket, and won this vast amount of money, this huge jackpot, I mean, what did that feel like? I was incredulous, and I think the silly part of it is that I recognized that, and I did immediately recognize that $50,000 wasn't millions, right? This wasn't automatically a life-changing number, but this was huge to me in my economic status, in my life experience, and I knew if I used it right that it could change my life. So I was a little nervous to ask my family if I would be able to keep the full amount of the money I offered to share as we were all playing this game. You know, I kind of changed the rules on my turn. That's the only reason why I had won. And they affirmed that it was my win, that I should keep the money, and they knew exactly what I wanted to do with it, which was to buy a home. So I felt finally this sense of relief where as long as I played my cards right, pun intended, <laughs> if I play this card right, then I could change my life for the better and get into a more stable housing situation. And, and that's exactly what you did from what I understand before... Yeah. Before we get into that, a lot of people are curious, what was the redemption process like of this ticket? Well, I was in Eastern Idaho at the time, but I lived in Boise. So I just hung out with my moms for a few days, and we kept celebrating the holiday. Meanwhile, I've got like the my eye on my ticket, which I kept in the dining room on a shelf. I didn't I didn't believe anyone would mess with it, but of course I was really anxious. That's a large amount of money to just keep on our shelf. <laughs> but I just hung out for a couple of days and then I drove back to Boise, which is where the the lottery office is, the Idaho State Lottery Office. So I had to go there to redeem it. I showed up, uh, I brought my dog with me, I left him in the car for like, 30 minutes or so well I went in and they did their whole security process what had occurred is when I arrived I gave them my ticket they took it to the back and then I just sat in the lobby and I waited all the while I experienced for the first time in my life or maybe I viewed for the first time in my life gambling addiction I saw people coming in and out um, with tickets that, that weren't winners that they were obsessed with they were obsessed with the idea that they were winners and they were causing fights and they were just putting change in the, to these machines to get more cards. But finally, my genuine winning ticket came out alongside a security guard who asked me a few questions about the ticket. And I was scared. I was like, they're not going to let me walk away with this money because he says, where did you get the ticket? And I said, I don't know. Like, I didn't buy it. <laughs> and he said, how did you get the ticket? I said, my mom gave it to me. And in my head, I'm like, well, what a likely story that I just like got a gift of a winning ticket. But um, I had scanned it after I won it, or after I realized it was a winner, so I could confirm with him that I went to a gas station. I had no idea which gas station, but I said somewhere in Idaho, I scanned it. 
<laughs> and they let me go. So they gave me the check. They did ask me if I wanted my taxes taken out up front. I chose to. And that has been a, a point of contention. When I tell this story, a lot of people think that was silly to have them take the taxes immediately. But to me, it was the financially uh, stable decision. I had never had this amount of money. And my main concern was the risk of overspending. And I think that's a pretty common pretty common cause for people to not be able to pay their taxes at the end of the year. I didn't want to fall for that. Why did they think it was silly that you're taking taxes out right away? A lot Since of people think that you should always take the lump sum, which is so funny. It's a, it's a, well, as I tell the story, particularly on TikTok, there are a lot of men who are older than me and they think they're wiser than me, but I am actually a finance major and I'm familiar with investments. So I know that if I were to invest $50,000 and wait to pay my taxes until near the end of tax season, I would still only have a few months for it to accrue any sort of interest payments. And I would need to choose a low risk investment, something similar to a CD. But they don't have a CD that's a short enough time period for me because I had won the money in December and cashed it immediately so I could have the money rather than waiting to the next year. Um, there's no CD that's like less than six months and I would need to pay my taxes by April. So in my mind, there wasn't really a, a safe investment where I could make more than 200 bucks in a matter of five months. And so it didn't make sense on top of the fact that I ended up needing tax documentation to purchase a house. They didn't believe me otherwise that I had just randomly come across this money without tax documents. And before you even went in, stepped into the lottery office to redeem this, you were at a gas station checking it at an automated checker. I saw one of your videos on TikTok. And for anyone interested, you're at Sydney Kidney Bean on TikTok. In one of your videos, you mentioned checking the ticket at an automated checker in a gas station before you turned it in. What was that like and how did that feel? As soon as I realized that I could have a winning ticket, and again, I was incredulous. I wasn't sure that I believed it was real because I had this core memory of when I was a child and my aunt sent my dad fake lottery tickets and we all celebrated thinking it was real and they were fake. So that's still where I was at. I remembered like what it felt like to think that you had won and then not. So that's why I was like, even though it was Christmas Eve, we had to find a gas station that was open and there was one. So my siblings and I all got in the car in my sister's car and drove there. There. And they had their tickets as well. They wanted to see how much they had won, even though it was between like five and 30 bucks. They still wanted their money. So when I went to scan it, I thought, I don't want to go to the person. I don't want to cause a ruckus and I don't want to put myself at risk. I'm a very, very passionate about risk management, as you can probably tell. Um, so I scanned it at the automatic scanner after my siblings had scanned theirs. Every time they scanned their tickets, it'd be like winner $30 or $20. When I scanned mine, it just said winner. It didn't put the amount. So I knew for sure that it was an authentic ticket, but I was still a little worried that it didn't tell me how much I would get. And so what did you do then? So after I had scanned it and realized that it was a verified winner, I bought water and gum. And I'm pretty sure I paid for my siblings, too. I'll have to ask them to verify. But I think I bought everyone little, like, candies or something at the gas station. And then we went home. And then um, I talked a little bit about what I wanted to do with the money. And my family engaged in that conversation. But I didn't want to talk about it too much because it didn't feel appropriate where, you know, it is still disappointing to them that they didn't get it to an extent, even though they didn't make me feel bad. I didn't want to sit there and dream about how cool my life was about to be. But I did mention to them that I wanted to buy a house as they knew. And I thought my other, my alternatives are to, well, stick around in Boise, maybe quit my job and just do school for a year so I could finally afford to focus on my studies or we could do a vacation. But at the end of the conversation, they were like, just hang on to it and see like how you feel, don't make a rash decision. And I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. But I had no intention of hanging on to it. I knew I wanted the house. I disregarded the other silly ideas about how I could, you know, relax for a year or do a vacation. I knew what would make my life better was to invest it in property. And you had a, an op-ed in the New York Times not too long ago where you mentioned, and I want to ask about that in a second, but within this, you mentioned that you were 
actually browsing houses before you won you were i mean were you imagining places or or what what was happening with that before well, you yeah yeah my life before i won the lottery i was living with a roommate it wasn't my first time living with a roommate but it had never been this bad before i I had moved in with someone that I didn't know too long, like probably five to six months, and we hit it off right away. We both had dogs the same age, puppies, that loved each other, and I wanted what was best for my dog, and it's also incredibly unaffordable to live in the Treasure Valley. It's known for being one of the the places in the United States that has the largest disparity between income level and cost of living. So I, to share an apartment, I was paying $1,100 on average a month, Um, for my half of the rent and utilities but working at a public elementary school as a paraprofessional or teacher's assistant I was making about nine dollars an hour so I had to borrow money from my student loans to live I had to take out more loans just to cover my cost of living despite being a full-time worker and then the real concern beyond the financial aspect of this was That my roommate often wouldn't pay her rent on time, which would mean that I would have to come up with an extra thousand dollars or so a month to make sure that we didn't get late fees and didn't get evicted. Our downstairs neighbor was trying to have us evicted because of noise. My roommate stopped taking care of her dog. So when I was out of the house and she was out of the house, her dog was at home for hours and hours, like upwards of 10 hours at a time. And then she would have parties as well. So in an apartment, we were making our downstairs neighbor miserable. It was making me miserable. I felt terrible and like guilt ridden for this dog, but I could only do so much. And so, yeah, I just hated living there after a while. That's why I began to dream about what I could do in the future. And I say dream because I knew it wasn't an option, but I also am fully comfortable and I always have been comfortable with planning on making my life better, planning on doing the things that I want, even if they don't feel reasonable at the time. So that's what I was doing when I was looking at Zillow, when I was researching mortgages, when I was asking questions to people with homes. I was dreaming, but really I just was planning without the feasibility. Bef- before you won the lottery, you were, you were yes. planning all of this. For months, for months I was planning it. And that's really the only way, I guess it's a coping mechanism that works well for me. If I'm in a situation that I don't like, I make my next plan. I dream about what my life is going to be like, how I can make life more enjoyable. And in this case, you know, my life was beautiful as it always has been, but the living situation was just so stressful that I I couldn't stand it any longer. So the only way to cope with that was to dream and plan for this next step, not knowing when I could take that step, but knowing that it would need to happen eventually to make my life better. Hmm. So what did that feel like when you could actually make this happen, when it did become a reality and you could, it could help you buy a, or invest on a, on real estate, which I believe is what you did. But what did that feel like Mm -hmm. when all of a sudden this dream could become a reality? It has been exactly what I envisioned. And that's not to say that it's not difficult, but I recognize I've done enough life changes and moves um, to know that things are hard when you make change. But everything is truly so much better um, because my dog has a yard. Like, that's a big thing. I don't have to just like let him walk around outside at the apartment occasionally. Like he can go lay out in the yard. I he's had separation anxiety really severely for the longest time and I could never get a second dog living in an apartment. But now I can. I did. And so he's got a brother and we live this really joyous life where we get to go to parks all the time and do hiking in a really dog friendly city. And my neighbors here aren't trying to get me evicted. They don't ever have noise complaints, first of all, because I'm not noisy. (laughs) But also, like, they'll bring me organic vegetables from their garden. They'll ask how I'm doing. We take our dogs on walks together. They, They invite me to the farmer's market. It's just this beautiful, affordable town, Pocatello, that I live in. And I, I got to say, every aspect of what I'm doing feels nicer. And I know I'm doing it in a stable sense. My mortgage is $587 a month. I could not have ever imagined that. <laughs> mm, that's, that's incredible. It wasn't too long ago that you actually wrote about this in 
the New York Times, there was an article in the New York Times that I believe was an op-ed, so, which means for people that aren't familiar with journalism terms and so forth, that you wrote this article. Is that correct? And, and how did that come about? <laughs> Well, as you had previous mentioned, previously mentioned, uh, I do TikTok. I have for about a year now. That was part of me needing a social space when I first moved to Pocatello, and I found my community online at first. So I started making TikToks every single day, and I mostly told stories about my life. So uh, I kind of built my community surrounding this account of at Sydney Kidney Bean on TikTok and. When I stepped into that role of being an online storyteller, I began to gain a lot of attention and especially for being intersex, telling my story about my biology and being an educator there. But when I gained a following of about like 60,000 followers, I started to mention how I had won a house, not won a house. I won the lottery to get a house and it got a little bit of traction, you know, 20,000 views or something. It was nice. But then... I just kept telling other stories and I thought that's not really what people want to hear about until probably four months ago now when I retold the story of how I won the lottery. When I scratched off my ticket and realized that I had just won the lottery, my immediate thought was, this is too much money to get from the gas station. <laughs> There's no way they have this in their register. So I looked it up on my phone and I found that if you win more than $1,000 in the state of Idaho, which is where I live, then you have to go to the actual lottery office, which is in Boise. And I was living in Boise at the time, but I wasn't there when I won the lottery because I was visiting family. I didn't want to wait days until I got back to Boise to see if this was a real ticket though. So I was like, okay, I guess I do have to go to the gas station. But I didn't want the gas station clerk to like scan it and steal it and I and I didn't want people around me to know that this was a very valuable ticket so I used one of the automatic scanners the automatic scanner confirmed my wildest dream that this ticket was an authentic winner and at that time I had a larger following I was you know I'm better known now on the internet so it took off gaining over 30 million views an editor from the New York Times saw my lottery video and sent me an email and said we would like to do an article on this I was very excited because I am used to uh, news outlets reaching out to me and wanting to do little summaries of my videos. Normally, they're like the UK Sun, and that's beautiful. I love them, but it's like a tabloid type of thing, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm used to like smaller tabloids reaching out to me and just being like, OMG, viral moment. When the New York Times reached out, then I thought this is going to be an actual story. So we set up a phone call and... I'm speaking with the editor on the phone and he says, I love your videos, love your story. I want to dive into this. And then he asked me how much experience I have with writing. And I said, do you mean how much experience I have with writers? Because I work with them. I work with reporters a lot. And he said, no, no, no. We want you to write the article. And I was like, I have so much experience. No problem. I can do that knowing that I'm not a writer. <laughs> But I believe in myself, so I was just like, yes, absolutely, no problem, I'll write this. But we spent about a month working on the article, developing the story of, well, I suppose we wanted to tell the story in a way that highlights the fact that people are working themselves to death and still unable to afford stability. And that is wrong. And there is no way that I could imagine myself escaping that if I hadn't won $50,000, which is a beautiful story for me, but it is also a tragic story for Americans. And that's what we wanted to discuss. And I think that we've gotten that point across. It took a lot of work and a lot of help from the editing team at the New York Times, but, but it's turned out to be pretty well written and received. Sometimes people get a little caught up in this whole, like, well, you're just bragging, you know, you got to win. I can't hope to win. And that's really not what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying that everyone can win the lottery because unf unfortunately we can't all win. But we can all dream about where we want to go next in life. We can all plan and work hard and hope. It sucks. It sucks. That's all we can do. But I respect that that's where the financial situation is right now for most Americans. Yeah. And what was it like when the article was published? Did you have people coming out of the woodwork? Or, I mean, that's a huge, that's 
arguably the largest or one of the largest media outlets in the world. So what was that like when, when that article was published? I think this is a little bit funny because I thought this is still a huge accomplishment for me, something I worked hard for and I appreciate the opportunity. But it's nothing like having a viral TikTok video. <laughs> you don't get nearly as much attention. Like the lottery video initially, I, I have people coming up all around town um, just being like, oh my gosh, are you Sydney Kidney Bean? I love your videos. I love hearing about how you won the lottery and it's given me a lot of opportunities. I'll had have people offer to do advertising deals and stuff. The article, I had friends and family be really excited for me and a few comments on my TikTok videos being like, hey, I'm here from the article. So it's a personal accomplishment and achievement, but it's nothing like the sort of buzz that surrounds a viral video. And the buzz that surrounds, I mean, you've had more than one video that has gotten substantial amount of views, but this one that you're referring to that I saw was over 32 million views. Mm -hmm. And so what did you, did you expect that to happen before it happened? And what did that feel like when it, was it an overnight thing that that went viral? What did that feel like? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. It, it wasn't expected, but also it is <laughs> because I work really hard to do what I do on TikTok. I'm very vulnerable and honest and I love storytelling. So uh, almost every day I get on there and I make a video or two and I expect that it will lead me towards success and I expect that every so often I'll get a viral video. I never know which one and I feel comfortable knowing that it's not up to me. I don't always know what people want to hear or how a video will be received. I just do my best to put out quality content. And when I told that story, I only told a little bit of it because I thought, why get into it if people don't really want to hear it? When I had a smaller audience, I talked about the lottery. People didn't really like it. So I only told like a minute and a half. So I'm sitting in the lobby of the lottery office and across from me is the safety glass and the secretary. And then behind her is a bunch of offices and cubicles. So a guy walks from back there into the lobby and he sits down next to me and he's like, I'm security, I gotta make sure this is legit. And I was like, okay. And he said, where did you buy this lottery ticket? And I said, I didn't buy the lottery ticket, my mom gave it to me. And then he said, okay, okay, and where have you taken the ticket? And I said, I ta I've taken it with me everywhere. I really don't want to lose it. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, I mean, like, did you scan it somewhere? Like, give me a timeline. So I told him that I had taken it to the gas station. I scanned it there and it said it was valid. I scanned it a few times when I was there to, like, make sure. And that's it. Like, I had gotten it in this city and then I took it here to Boise. And he was like, okay, that checks out. You can have your money. And that's part of what made it go viral. People didn't enjoy that it cut off. They're like, oh, we hate part twos. Why didn't you tell the whole story in one video? Well, I just wanted to give you a sample to see what you wanted. <laughs> so it was unexpected, but also expected because I'm on this pathway to continue to tell my stories. And I know that when I connect with people, it leads to success. So that was a really beautiful moment. And it led to a lot of great opportunity, including the New York Times article. Hmm. And what, what other opportunities? I'd say that some of the larger ones have been, like I said, this sort of public recognition that I receive around town is a different level of community that I now have access to. I've been able to form friendships in my school and in my life because I've gotten viral videos. I've also been able to make a living now off of TikTok. And again, like, I, I'm just so excited to have financial stability that I haven't ever had in my life. So I went from, you know, finally getting this house, but still having to work and live off of student loans to a year later after doing TikTok, being able to just pay my bills from telling stories, not even doing any advertising. After that video, I have not had to worry about meeting my needs. Hmm. And for people that aren't familiar, how do how do you make money on how does someone make money on TikTok for people that aren't familiar? There are a myriad of ways and they're always trying to come up with new ways. In the past, I was part of the creator fund, which paid out not very well. I would say like probably a couple thousand dollars after a year. Not quite a year. But anyways, it didn't pay very well. And that was like the only way that creators were 
paid and it was based off of a combination of views and what else watch time so uh, what they did in this last spring is they rolled out a new program that was going to be better for long form content creators and it's called i believe the creativity program beta still a beta program but what they are doing is they are promoting the work of those who make videos longer than a minute and they do so by actually paying you when you get views and watch time and engagement so that is now how i'm able to sustain myself off of tiktok in the past where the creator fund didn't pay me very well i had to also look into advertising opportunities which can be very profitable and good for some but i personally don't love to sell things so that's not what i enjoy doing and that's not what i have to do now wow well congratulations on your success for people that want to check out your page on TikTok that is at Sydney Kidney Bean. We will also put a link to that in the details of this video and this of this podcast, this interview. So how does this success compare? So you have literally won the lottery and you've had these extremely viral videos on TikTok, both arguably things that a lot of people really wish to achieve. How does how do they compare? How does winning the lottery compare to having a video that gets over 32 million views? Getting a video that large is like winning the lottery again. And I mean that in a literal sense, in a monetary sense. Um, it's not a $50,000 video, but it is a video that cr provides me stability in my career on TikTok the same way that my house provides me stability in my life <laughs> to live and sleep in my own bed at night. So I think that they are very similar in comparison in the way that they have changed my life because I use them appropriately. I like to believe that I do. I think that if I work hard and I have objectives that, that eventually I will reach them and I try not to worry about when or how. And that's what makes things. That's what makes life so much fun is I always expect success for myself, but I don't know what that success is going to look like. So that's, that's what I continue to live right now. And it's been especially lovely to experience these two really big landmarks in my life just a year and a half apart. And you made a video about your thoughts on luck and how you, well, I'll let you explain. Oh, yeah. But, but you made a video on your thoughts on luck and how I believe that it was, you were alluding to some of your spiritual thoughts. And I know some people watching this are into this topic, but... What are your thoughts on being lucky when it mm -hmm. comes to spirituality and that sort of thing or energy? I think that having a hunger for luck is a very dangerous thing. And I am someone who has bipolar one. And so there are times when I may experience certain delusions. Um, those with bipolar one and those who experience mania are very likely to become gambling addicts, to overspend, to do dangerous things. And so I recognize from my experience that to have a hunger for luck and a want for something exciting can be really dangerous physically, emotionally, mentally. What I have always thought of luck as is not really something that I'm trying to get, I'm trying to attain. Like I said, I know it will come if I do things right. I believe in a sort of luck -a meter is what I envision in my head, where I've always thought if I do enough good things, something really good will happen to me. The first time I remember like recognizing this was in... I think I was in eighth grade when I won the future city competition right before the winners were announced. I thought in my head, like I've done a lot of good things. I feel like I've been a genuine and good person. And this is a time when I feel like that could pay off. And it did. And I won. And I just thought that was such a helpful way to process putting in hard work. And anytime I've thought, well, I really earned this, you know, my luck meter is full. It's time for something good to happen to me. And it doesn't. Then I just refocus on like, where are places in my life where I could be doing more for others? Um, am I studying hard in school? Am I taking care of my community? And I just go back to that, and I wait for another one of these moments where, where my luck meter is really full. <laughs> it helps me navigate life. Would you say that you visualize and focus your energy on positive outcomes in general? 
My philosophy, or I don't know if it's so much a philosophy as it is a strategy, is I like to envision what I want in life, and I build a plan to get there, and then I do it. And I think that many people get stuck on various steps here. Some people just visualize. Some people don't actually do it even when they've planned it. But I do all three of those steps, and I do visualize them. And I dislike when this is misconstrued as law of attraction because I don't think you can just manifest anything into your life. I think that can be really ignorant of privilege personally, and it's just not the way that I view things. But I do believe that a lot of good can happen and a lot of good tends to happen when you think of what you want, you plan for it, and you attain it. And visualizing that for me helps a lot. I'm a visual person. I studied art for a long time. So I just kind of think in pictures. And I got to say, it's been working so far. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You have yeah, achieved quite a bit of success in a, in a short period of time. So what would you say to someone that wins $50,000 from the lottery tomorrow or that wins, wins a prize that's, that's significant to them? I would hope that there was already something that they needed or wanted. That's what made my money go to a good place, I think. And and maybe this is why we don't hear so much from those people who win less than 100000 because it's pretty easy to spend. It's easy to go to Vegas. It's easy to buy a car, do, do whatever. But I hope that when people have a stroke of luck, they think about what they've been needing and wanting, and that's what they put it towards. Sometimes we get this magic of money before our eyes, and there's so much emotion that goes into financial management that interrupts financial management really and it's best if you can set that aside and think about what you needed and wanted before you had money sometimes it's going to be something silly i think there are people who might have i can't even come up with an example even if it is something silly i believe that you will be fulfilled and happy with where you place your money if it's something that you wanted before you had the money and for you it was it's real estate yeah for me it's my house Mm-hmm. And it has been everything I imagined it would be. How did people react on TikTok in the comments with your video that went viral about this? Most people were just mad that my initial video was so short. They they hate watching part twos. <laughs> so a lot of people didn't like my storytelling. Um, but that's because people like to comment when they're angry. I suppose the larger the larger portion of commenters were telling me that I shouldn't tell anyone that I won the lottery. They didn't know that I had already spent my money. So they thought it was absurd that I was telling them the state that I live in and that I had won. But I actually challenged this idea of not telling people you won. I can understand it's different with varying amounts, but I do believe that if you are around people who really love and care about you, it's not generally an issue Flaunting money could be an issue, I suppose. But anyways, not to get into that. There are a lot of people on TikTok that just feel happy to see lottery money go to something that feels worthwhile. And I think the unfortunate thing is that it feels so worthwhile and my story resonates with people because we're all dreaming for stability that we can't have no matter how hard we work. So to finally see someone get it, it makes people feel good. Yeah, it's a it's a really, really wonderful story. I'm I am so happy for you. So I want to ask about the check, because with a lot of lottery wins, of course, they give you people these giant checks and take mm-hmm. photo ops and so forth. What what was that like? Did they give you a check and and how did they pay you? So they gave me a medium sized check. So it wasn't a tiny check, but it was like three feet long. So it was still pretty big. And It was on poster board and they did have me pose with it, which I didn't want to do because I just wanted to grab my money and go. But I'm also too embarrassed to say no. So I just sat there for the little picture and then they walked out with the real sized check and gave that to me, which I just drove over to my brain to my bank. And they I used to work at a bank. I'm familiar with how normally if people come in with lottery checks, you have to talk to them and be like, you're being scammed. But these people, they must have seen lottery checks in the past because they knew it was legitimate and it was made available in my account within 24 hours, I believe. It's quite rapid. 
But that's also something that can be done when you are with a bank for a long period of time. The, the variables on your funds being available depends on whether or not they can legitimize the check as well. So it was pretty simple. Hmm. Were you, were you nervous at all when you were carrying around a check for that amount when you were going to cash it in? The windows were up in the car, absolutely, because I was so scared it would fly out the window. But again, I used to work at the bank, so I knew that even if I lost this check, then I would just go get it reissued, which would not be fun. But but that helped calm my nerves. I think that payment as an, it's not as a, what is the word? It's not as frivolous. There's a lot of technology behind payment now, so I knew there would be proper record. And in the state of Idaho, do you have to claim prizes publicly do you, or do you have a choice? I don't know. I I just was focused on my own thing. So I didn't really want to be on the website, especially now, because people have looked me up and, you know, I'm, I try to be private, but I realize that's not really sustainable in, in the world of the internet. So it would have been nice if I could be private, but... I didn't ask. So either it's an option and I'm just too timid or it's not an option. <laughs> I want to back up real quick. Before you even redeemed the ticket, what did you do with it? Did you put it someplace secure or what happens with a ticket worth $50,000 before you bring it in? My mom has a hutch of sorts. It's where, you know, you, you place the fancy dishes and it's got a little cabinet on it. And I thought, I don't want this in my room, especially because I have a dog. I would hate for my dog to chew it up. So I'm going to place it on the hutch and everyone knew. And I thought like, oh, I, I said out loud, what if someone steals it? My mom's like, no one's going to steal it. Like we literally just sat there and let you win your $50,000. No one's going to steal your money. And I was like, you're right. Like I was just being a little paranoid. So I left it there for a couple of days underneath a, a vase that I set on top of it just to keep it like protected. I don't want it to get wet or anything. So when it was time for me to leave, I just grabbed it and I put it in my car and I left. I think it was just in a little, the little compartment underneath the radio so I could like watch it while I was driving. <laughs> and yeah, nothing, no ill came of it, mm. of my placement of the ticket, luckily. Were you when you left it under the vase and you would, I assume, leave the room once in a while or leave where that was? Did you come back and check on it once in a while, make sure it's still? There? I did in the mornings <laughs> when I woke up after sleeping. I was like, okay, that's still there. That really happened, but more so to like just check and make sure it was there, not because I worry about other people getting to it. Yeah, I'm I'm just very lucky to have an incredibly trustworthy family that would never do that. So even in my moments where I was like, what if someone steals it? Like, that's an absurd thought. They don't want my money. They're happy for me. If it was them, I would have to respect them too. I think we're all that same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it sounds like this has been a really positive experience for you that this winning the lottery has been a windfall. And subsequently this TikTok, your several TikTok videos that have gone viral, including this one that over 32 million views. You can check out Sydney Kidney Bean on TikTok. It's at Sydney Kidney Bean. We will put a link to that in the description of this interview. But I know we don't have tons of more time, but is there anything that you wanted to say today that, that I don't know enough to ask or that you just wanted to say today? Well, I did get back some of the money in taxes. So I initially paid 15000 almost in taxes. And, well, let's see. I gave a $50,000 ticket for about $37,000 on the check. And then I regained $4,000 on my tax return. So I didn't expect money back, but I, wasn't, I was pleasantly surprised when I received money back. In the past, when I've talked about this, a lot of people have asked if my mom was jealous because she's the one that bought the ticket, if I ever paid her $5. When I tell her about these comments, she just laughs. She's like, why would I want your $5? Like, why would I want your ticket? That was for the game. It was for the family. I'm just happy that someone won. So I think that's what I would just reiterate is that the reason why I was able to attain my dreams after 
after winning this amount of money was fully because of my family, not only because they facilitated the winning ticket and because they let me change the rules, but because they support me and they protect my dreams. And I, I can't be more appreciative of that. Yeah, that is, that is wonderful. I'm, yeah, I'm so, I'm so happy for you. Thank and, you. Appreciate yeah. you. Yeah. And is there anything else that you wanted to say about, about this? Maybe live life like you are going to win the lottery just in case, <laughs> like plan on it, plan on winning some money because it's always good to have an idea of what you would do with $50,000. It can really help you out if the time comes around and it's a fun game anyways. <laughs> Absolutely. And you can't win if you don't play as cliche. I mean, it's true, but I've never that's... bought a ticket. I still you, haven't. You've never purchased a lottery ticket? I have never played the lottery, and I'm the only person I know who won the lottery. Well, now I know you, but <laughs> yeah, I've never played. I had like a thought about it the other day. I was like, I feel like I should put some money into that machine over there, but I didn't have any cash. So why have you never played the lottery? Well, my luck meter. I'm not sure it's full yet. <laughs> and also, same thing is like I recognize that it can make you hungry for it, and I have a mental illness that can like cause you to like want to risk things and to gamble. Like it's pretty well known that those with bipolar one can become gamblers. And I just figure like, why, why go into it for no reason? If I feel one day a specific urge to buy a lottery, then I'll assume it's my luck meter telling me it's time. But until then, I'm just not even going to worry about it. <laughs> Maybe that sounds silly, does it? <laughs> no, not at all. Well, you won. Have you been playing? I, I don't play very often these these days, but I mean, if something inspires me, I'll, I'll play. But uh, I, I always tell people to, you know, never spend more than you can afford and have fun with it. Mm -hmm. So if you're having fun with it, but also remember that you do have a chance because some, I mean, somebody has to win. <laughs> but it's very you, true. It's safer. I like the idea of attaching it to a game the way that my family does because it can make it like a really safe and exciting thing and, and a family moment um, rather than just like, oh, every time I get cigarettes, I also get a lottery ticket. Like that's not maybe a sustainable habit. <laughs> yeah. And is that that's something that your family does regularly or annually or? Have, yeah. Have you... Last year, no one won anything. <laughs> It was a little different, but we'll do it again this year. Well, I, I hope someone wins another grand prize. Well, if the luck -a meter fills up, it is completely possible. We all got to be really good this year. It's possible that I have just like taken the story of Santa Claus. Like, if you're good all year, you get a gift. <laughs> Maybe that's where I'm getting this from. <laughs> Everyone can you can check out Sydney Beans on TikTok at Sydney kidney bean again we will put a link to that below um sydney any any last words here i appreciate you and i love your podcast so thank you for having me yeah thank you so much for joining today i really appreciate your time your story is very inspiring and i am so happy for you so thank you very much thank you so that was my podcast interview with Sydney Bean. If you liked this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Let me know in the comments, what did you think of this interview? I love checking out your comments. I will put a playlist to other interviews with lottery winners on this channel in the description of this interview. Get notified when new interviews are released on this channel. Go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when they come out. As always, thank you so much for watching and thank you for your support.